Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. In time, the alternate history podcast. Don sitting in the host chair today, flying the What If Machine solo on uh, what'll be a quick little hit today. Uh, we've been working to sort of catch up on our production schedule as we get to the latter part here of summer and real life getting in the way of the fun that we enjoy doing the podcast, but we're getting things back on track. But we're going to look today at a little exercise that's not important history in the sense of the types of things that we do here, but I think it's somewhat significant in terms of modern pop culture, particularly American pop culture in the last 20 years, and music culture in the United States in the last 20 years. Uh, I'm going to look here today at the impact of what if there had not been an American Idol. Uh, So today is one of those episodes that we categorize quote-unquote as whimsy uh, versus being uh, deep historical, but I think it is impactful in terms of the way that we look at things as a society now, in terms of the popularity of uh, things like uh, reality shows, uh, pop culture, music, and how that works, and how all that plays together in our our media culture now, and how it's evolved over the the period of time now, almost 20 years uh, since the debut of American Idol. And so when we come back after the break, we'll pick back up with the concept of what if there had been no American Idol? Alexis and Don taking just a quick break from the podcast here. Normally, this is where we would have an ad or a, a, a mention. I think that's the, the inside term that we're supposed to. A brand mention is what they're called, at least on the website, when we're, when we're loading an episode. But today, I'm just going to directly appeal for one of the other ways that you can help the podcast where you may not get as much directly back in return as we do from the others, but still something that's important. So, Lex, what is Patreon? So Patreon is a platform where actually you can go and support the podcast that you love, including A Fork in Time. Yeah, and it's not just podcasts there. Patreon is probably the number one um, platform for artists and and folks who have various things to be supported on. So podcasts frequently are there, but it can be YouTube channels. It can be the other things that are there. But basically it's your opportunity to become a subscriber or a, uh, a patron, hence Patreon, uh, for the show. So here at A Fork in Time, uh, we do have a few patrons, and we appreciate them. It doesn't cost a tremendous amount of money uh, to put on a podcast, but it does cost money. And so over time, one of the ways that you can help us defray the cost of the podcast, we've been able to use some of the money to upgrade the equipment that we use. Hopefully you notice that from time to time, is actually by supporting us on Patreon. So Alexis, how do you? how does someone find how to support us on Patreon? Just go to the link in the show notes. You'll see a Patreon link and click on that and you'll get all set up. Yeah, the other place you can go is actually to our website, which is www.aforkintimepodcast.com. There's a Patreon link there, as well as other non-monetary ways that you can support the show. Uh, Alexis and I have said this a number of times. We did not start a podcast to retire on. Uh, It's not that lucrative, particularly not a niche podcast about alternate Alternate history. history. Uh, but but still there are costs in doing that. So if you can help us out either through financial or non-financial means, we certainly would appreciate it. And we appreciate, again, the fact that we have built a global audience of what we think of as being our little community. And so we invite you to be part of that. Anything else you want to say about that, Lex? Just thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today on A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. And again, we're heading down one of our more whimsical kind of what-if paths today. I'm going to fly this brief solo episode. Probably won't give this episode justice. Uh, This episode probably deserved to have more of a panel approach to get different approaches and thoughts brought into it, but we're going to go ahead anyway. So as I introduced before the break, the concept today is what if there had been no American Idol? And American Idol premiered about 20 years ago in the United States, uh, premiered in the summer of 2002. And so recognizing now that there are kids in college here in the United States that definitely don't remember a time when American Idol did not exist. Of course, it went off the air for a couple of years after leaving the Fox television network here in the United States before being revived on ABC, uh, the ABC network, a couple of years ago. 
But it's actually interesting to think about what a cultural phenomenon American Idol was and how it changed things in the music industry that I think arguably can be said to have changed television in a major way. And as a result of changing music and television, you do have an impact certainly on popular culture in the United States and also globally. There wasn't just an American Idol. There were idols that popped up all over the world. In fact, American Idol itself is an import from the British show Pop Idol. And we'll talk a little bit about that, or I'll talk a little bit about that as we move through this episode and, and how the show came to be and thus its influence. But it actually, when you have an impact on music, when you have an impact on television, again, you're certainly not only uh, impacting popular culture, but once you've impacted popular culture, you're impacting culture in general. So whether you think those changes would have happened anyway, whether you think they are incredibly consequential, maybe you think that it's trivial, the things that go on in the area of uh, pop culture and how they influence culture, there is no doubt that there was an influence and things would have been different. Even if something like American Idol had come along, things would have been different without American Idol. And so that's what I want to explore today is what if there had been no American Idol? Perhaps a good place to start is to sort of put things in the context of a culture, particularly the television culture of that time. American Idol falls, uh, when it premieres in the summer of two, of 2002, and I think it's important that it's a summer sort of fill-in series. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit in terms of then how it transforms and how it morphs. But this comes on the heels about two years after the success of a... Um, of a show on CBS television here in the United States called Survivor. It's also interesting to me as I look through the history of, of television shows, just in general, and other things as well, music has this element as well, how often these things are imported from other sources. Survivor had not been uh, the American version of Survivor as a reality, uh, reality there perhaps in air quotes, as a reality television series, had not been originated in the United States either. It, it was an import uh, uh, fr from, from foreign television. And, of course, American Idol uh, follows about two years later during the wave of, because of the success of Survivor, this idea of uh, the television networks looking for interactive ways to maintain an audience over multiple episodes. And reality shows, particularly reality shows uh, where there's participation by the public, which is going to be one of the elements of American Idol, but reality shows over time tend to draw and maintain an audience because they are a continuous narrative uh, that goes from episode to episode. If you think about most drama on TV, situation comedies, a lot of shows, yes, there may be story arcs that go over time, and so there's a benefit from being a regular um, viewer of the show. Uh, but the, something gets lost very often in the sense that each episode can be and often is a standalone episode. Uh, so frequent viewers understand the characters and maybe understand some of the things that are brought in. But someone who has sort of never seen the show before can watch an episode of most of the one-hour dramas that appear on TV uh, as a self-contained unit. They may not enjoy it as the same way as a regular viewer was, but it, it's a contained element there. That's not true necessarily of, of a reality show, a reality competition show, in quite the same way. And so Survivor, once again, uh, showed the evidence of the benefit of building an audience over time towards, towards a finale. In this case, there's no audience participation because what's going on in Survivor are the contestants, the participants on the show, are voting and deciding who remains on the show. So there was no direct audience participation, but the concept remains the same. So when you come along to American Idol as a fill-in show being brought over after success in the United Kingdom, uh, for a show called Pop Idol, um, American Idol fits in as a summer replacement. And it's an interesting thing to note that, you know, that concept still exists to some degree in terms of the American television season roughly running from the fall through the spring, but that has become a little bit more loose and lessly defined in terms of having a larger channel universe, the cable universe, the satellite TV universe, uh, where there's not just three or four major networks that are dominating uh, the content in such a way that they dictate the schedule and they dictate their quote-unquote seasons with the start of new shows traditionally in the fall running through to the spring. But even in that environment, and even so today, there's often a use inside of the net network television of things that fill in over the summer. 
And normally that comes in the form of reruns, knowing that the audience is less available because of vacations and travel and just the nature of what summer is means that you're uh, less likely to have strong ratings than you are during the fall, winter, and spring, uh, when because of weather conditions and when because of the regularity of the education system, of school season, etc., that you're able to have a more stable audience from week to week, and you want a stable audience because it's all about advertising revenue. And so during the summer, a common uh, trait of many of the major broadcast networks were to, were to do reruns or to do things that were short-lived, that were sort of fill-in types of things. And so American Idol fits this description. The first season of American Idol runs for a very short period of time, just several months, uh, beginning in, um, in June of 2002. And the concept is brought over almost directly intact from what it was on Pop Idol in, in Britain, which is that there are... Uh, through a series of auditions, these uh, these particular contestants are found who have talent. Uh, they compete against each other by by singing, and then the viewing audience uh, votes on them. And the one receiving the lowest votes, or multiple ones receiving the lowest votes, are eliminated from the show until you eventually get down to a head-to-head competition between two contestants for the winner. Along the way, there are a panel of judges who have some expertise or knowledge or understanding that are providing feedback uh, to the contestants, but are also serving as a catalyst to guide and, in some cases, antagonize the audience. Of course, one of the unique elements of American Idol is not only were the contestants on the show um, uh, to become popular, but the judges themselves, and except for one of the judges... Uh, in the initial version of American Idol, that would be uh, former pop star, singer, dancer Paula Abdul. She would have been known to a great deal of the public going back to the mid to late 80s and then through the early part of the 90s when she had some commercial success as a recording artist and as an entertainer. But the other two uh, judges on the original version of American Idol, that would be Simon Cowell, the name that when I say that now you know, but before the premiere of American Idol... In 2002, there wouldn't have been a lot of folks who would have known who Simon Cowell was. By the end of that first summer run, everybody knew who Simon Cowell was. He was the acerbic, critical, controversial foreign judge, in this case the British judge who was on the American Idol TV show. And then Randy Jackson, who had been a musician and producer, um, but not someone who was known necessarily in the public eye. He was not an individual solo artist. Uh, He'd been part uh, a later part of a version of the musical group Journey, but primarily was known as as a producer and someone in behind the scenes role uh, in the American music scene. And so this concept of allowing the audience to participate and allowing the audience to vote, as I've already mentioned, is the catalyst for the success of the format in terms of driving ratings. And to some degree, Fox caught you know some lightning in a bottle that uh, summer of two thousand two. And uh, in a very short period of time, the, the ratings for the show were phenomenal, and it became uh, something of a, of a cultural thing in the short term. Uh, so even if American Idol only lasted that one season, it would have been the, uh, you know, the short-lived uh, pop into American pop culture, of uh, something that would have been remembered probably even 20 years later because it became a phenomenon in that summer season. But it actually uh, quickly was discovered to have legs that went beyond that. And so Kelly Clarkson was the first winner of the show, and she is probably still one of the better-known artists that have uh, come out of the show in terms of commercial success, success um, in terms of of playtime on radio, sales of albums, those types of things. Kelly Clarkson, the original American Idol, is an icon against uh, many of the future winners of the show, talked about being inspired by or being compared to. Uh, Even as we sit here there today, she is not the most successful (laughs) artist in terms of record sales that's come out of American Idol. And I just want to spend some time talking about that when I talk about the influence of the show, uh, moving on a little bit further here into the episode. Uh, But she wins the show, uh, and then she releases her first single, which was the winning single, the thing that she sang at the conclusion of the first show called A Moment Like This, which goes on to be a number one record, and the sales are there. And so the concept of American Idol is not only launched, into American pop culture, to the American television scene, and the American music scene, uh, but also uh, then becomes an influencing factor. So remember that if you're looking in May of 2002, nobody knows who Kelly Clarkson is, the winner of that first season of American Idol. Mere months later, not only does America know who Kelly Clarkson is, and sort of feels like they know her better because they watched her evolve 
over this uh, this short lived series over the competition show, but they have been a part of seeing that she wins the show, and she is launched into immediately being able to release an album where she was not an artist that's known before that rises very quickly to the top of the charts, and then is able to follow that up. Actually, she didn't even release an album; she released a single. She's able to follow that up very quickly with an album that has success, and so a major artist on the American pop music scene is born in a very short period of time. When we're talking about what if there had been no American Idol, I think we would have seen the continuation of what had been the system that American music brought artists to for before that. Uh, prior to that, the way that you actually became someone who was played on the radio, who released albums, was you came through the system of the, uh, of the various music production companies. Uh, so you're dealing with record companies. Record companies had entire departments, A&R departments, who were in the business of acquiring talent, looking out talent, uh, you know, going, going to see folks who were playing in clubs, basically looking for stars, looking for artists that they could develop and polish and produce, and as a result of that, sell records and make money. And so, you know, prior to... American Idol, while there are exceptions to this, crossover artists, for example, from television who also did something in music or other things like that, most of the way that the music business worked were things were driven by and were under the control of the record labels. It would only be artists after they had grown to a certain popularity and certain following that had the ability to either break away, form their own label, or be independent from their label. But basically, every musical artist, songwriter, anyone that was in the music business was looking in some way, shape, form, or fashion to get a record deal. And a record deal required that you be identified uh, by a record company, that you be uh, a, a talent they wanted to pursue, that they wanted to produce, that one that they wanted to invest in and develop. And then they took over... Uh, the production of your of your early work, and they also took over the promotion of your early work. And so, while there were, were and still are tons of talented musicians and singers and songwriters, not only in the United States but worldwide, that are at least as talented, many would argue, or even more talented than many that we know as a result of popular culture, it becomes a case of were you discovered? Artists, singers, songwriters, musicians are looking to be discovered because you needed to be discovered in order to be brought into this system and thus have a chance to, to be prolific in the music industry. American Idol, one of its major influences, so if there had not been an American Idol, that process would have likely continued for some time into the future, whether that's years or decades or whether that would still be the way that things work today. Uh, probably not. We'll talk a little bit about another phenomenon, I think, that plays with this. But it definitely changed the way that the industry works. And so if there is no American Idol, you would have had that continue. With American Idol, you now have a conduit for artists. Again, now they have to audition still, and they still have to make it through a series of cuts with producers, and then ultimately be, uh, find fandom uh, with a voting public to work their way through the show, to become familiar, uh, to perhaps win the show. But they have an avenue to actually bypass or shortcut what had been the process before. And that's important. Uh, before, you would have had to be discovered. Now you can seek to be self-discovered by going to the auditions. And if you're talented enough and compelling enough, and that may not just be your ability to sing, that may be your personality, your look. Uh, certainly there's been a lot of influence and discussion about how American Idol very often is not about the best singer, but it's about the best entertainer that may come out of that. But you have a chance to actually stand out. If, you're, if you have the talent to stand out in a crowd against your peers, you have a chance to make it onto the show, and you have a chance to make it onto the show. You have a chance to work through this process, which worked for Kelly Clarkson, and then worked for countless others. And in fact, one of the interesting phenomena of the show is even the non-winners who stuck around long enough to get attention and to get recognition often went on to having some success. Not every name that you know from American Idol, and I could go through and just run off the list here, was the winner of the show. In fact, in many years, uh, the artist that has uh, come to sell the most records, uh, the artist that's become uh, probably the best known, was not the actual winner that year of the show. And so winning was important, but not every winner has gone on to have a stellar music career, especially as there are now a list of 19 winners that have, uh, that have won over the course of the show's two iterations. 
Uh, but many times it was the artist who stuck around long enough on the show to get recognition, who didn't gain widespread popular support or just wasn't popular enough to garner the votes for whatever reason, but they were noticed by other music um, uh, executives and, and realized that this allowed them to shortcut even that process of finding the next star. The one that really jumps out to me is Jennifer Hudson. Jennifer Hudson has gone on to a tremendous amount of fame, including an Academy Award win uh, for participating in a musical. Jennifer Hudson did not win her season of American Idol, and yet she has had a stellar career. She continues to have a stellar career, even though she was not the winner of that particular show. But I think it can be well argued that if there had been no American Idol, it's doubtful it's not impossible, certainly, but it's doubtful that someone like Jennifer Hudson might have been recognized, might have been discovered by the record labels as they existed at the time, or other types of talent scouts looking for an actress who could sing, that type of thing. She has an opportunity that exists that if there is no American Idol, we probably would not know the name Jennifer Hudson today or the talent that she represents. And you can say that with a, a pretty long list of folks, so much so that I don't even want to get into that list here. Uh, because I will overlook somebody or, you know, somebody will go missing. But that's the impact of the American Idol experience, and thus if there had been no American Idol, that wouldn't take place. The other thing that I think we can say about if there had not been an American Idol is that uh, the nature of reality television and competition shows on television that certainly might have come to be, again, Survivor had already existed there, but in terms of doing something that is interactive week to week with the public and all the various ways that you can play that together from a media standpoint would also have been missing. So if there is no American Idol, there's a host of other shows that have come along that were also uh, competition shows with public voting. Even today, <laughs> there's shows like The Voice, which competes with American Idol. In fact, Kelly Clarkson, the original winner of American Idol, is a judge on The Voice to show how these two things go together, but other types of show is, shows as well, Dancing with the Stars. Again, we, we could go on and list a large number of these competition reality shows that have come to be as a result of the American Idol experience. One of the other phenomena that came as a result of American Idol, I think that's important to note, is the idea, which had already existed, this was not new, but sort of was able to go to new levels, the idea of cross-promotion by the commercial sponsors. So, for example, uh, the Ford Motor Company and Coca-Cola in the early days of American Idol. And understand, for its first eight seasons, American Idol was the top-rated television show on TV. And so its ability to uh, command top dollar from advertisers to be a, literally a cash cow for Fox as they used it from their January through May period, so they were able to use it uh, during two of the sweeps periods, which are used to set advertising rates, uh, the way that they were able to convert the popularity of the show into advertising revenue by having these special direct sponsors. So, for example, in the early years, Ford uh, would um, was, was a major sponsor. For example, the contestants waited around in the Ford lounge or the Ford, uh, Ford area backstage when they weren't actually performing, and that was a prominent thing. I remember one of the things about that show in particular is like there was a coffee table that had like a tire with a glass top again, because Ford was there. Coca-Cola was the soft drink sponsor, and so you could see Coke-adorned, uh, logoed um, drinking glasses there on the judges' table with whether they had Coke in them or not didn't matter. Coke was the visible thing that was on the outside. And so, the, in fact, even in the, in the case of Ford, the contestants each week would do a little uh, commercial video kind of thing that cross-promoted. And so one of the things uh, that American Idol had an impact on, and thus if there is no American Idol, is accelerating this idea of how you could use a reality competition, public voting television show to connect with sponsors in a way that the sponsors achieve sort of a unique benefit from having, having done so. I mean, that music video uh, that was sort of a Ford commercial in the middle of, uh, of, of each episode, particularly in those early years, was exactly that. It was a commercial for Ford, the product, but it was taking advantage of the popularity of the contestants on the show. Remember, these are contestants that people didn't even know before that particular season of the show came along. Ford was actually able to capitalize on emerging star popularity, very cheap to do in the context of doing at least that part of it inside the context of the show, Coca-Cola as well. 
Well, since this is a voting show, then you have the ability for companies like AT&T to come along. And so one of the ways that you could vote was by um, you know, sending uh, text messages or doing other things that interacted with the communications device. So AT&T gets a sponsorship hit off of being part of the show, but also gets, uh, gets the benefit of using their technology and employing their technology into the show. Over time, the other thing that, of course, is going on here, which is another impact in the music industry that I think American Idol plays into, and so once again, if there is no American Idol, how does this work, is the fact that, remember that Kelly Clarkson delivered a single that was released to radio, and by the way, part of the prize was winning a recording contract, so the old style of, uh, of being discovered as an artist and suddenly having a recording contract was embedded into the show at the time, and it still is today, but not quite in exactly the same way, is that she released a single. And so while it was certainly true that singles had been released before, for most of the music business industry, a single has been a single song or a single cut off of an artist's album. In the case, over, t over time, the music industry has produced just singles, meaning an individual song to be released by an artist. But most of the time, the single, what gets play on the radio, is a single track off of an artist album, You know, ranging anywhere from probably 8 to 12 songs, 10 sort of being the norm on an album. It's the selected song off of that album that uh, the producers believe will have the most chance of getting airplay and popularity. And this is in a period of time prior to or up through most of the, uh, of the music industry until the rise of the digital age of music, when, yes, you could go buy the single in the form uh, back in the old days of a 45 record as opposed to the 33 and a third album, uh, but most of the, or, or cassette or CD as the case might be, as you know, albums became on other media, but most folks heard the single and then went and bought, to obtain the music, they bought the album. Uh, so it was converting one song into having you buy 10. Maybe you'll like the other stuff, and eventually those will be released as singles as well to attract other listeners, particularly if there's diversity on the album. Uh, but the single was a means to sell the album, the larger unit. I like the one. Okay, you're going to buy the other nine as well. But what had started to happen as a result of the digital age, the rise of the Internet, uh, the rise of music piracy, in the form of being able to be digitalized, so Napster comes along, is that you have this unique backdrop where it's possible to go illegally, <laughs> initially at first, and go actually obtain just that single. You didn't need to buy the album. By the way, you could also obtain the whole album from the artist in a digital form illegally through Napster or through file sharing. But as eventually as Napster is shut down and that converts to being a, a true commercial authorized version, of being able to access music digitally as we have the rise of, of iTunes, um, and particularly with Apple. So this comes along uh, in just a few years directly after the premiere of American Idol. And suddenly what you have is the ability to directly market that single essentially in real time to an audience that's willing to pay for it while the process is going on. So, for example, uh, um, each week as an artist may perform, uh, you know, one of the things that the host, Ron Seacrest, will say, and you can download that on iTunes. And so the, um, the ability to monetize not only the winners, uh, not, not Kelly Clarkson releasing a moment like this, but the ability to monetize the music all the way through the process by all the various artists and immediately have the revenue flow from downloads that are instantaneous. Hey, I just like what I heard there. I want that on my digital music player now. So you pay your 99 cents, your dollar ninety nine, whatever the rate might be, and you have that. That's an instant sale that did not require the production of or the pressing of an album or a, a, a CD, didn't require shipping, didn't require stock, didn't retire, require inventory. And so American Idol, as a platform each week, for featuring an artist and then the ability for someone, in this case Fox and or the record company who have now owned the rights, the music production company owning the rights to that artist, being able to directly convert it into revenue almost in real time with incredibly low relative overhead was one of the major things that American Idol brought into the music business. Now, there are those that argue that uh, digital has totally, and I believe this is true, has totally disrupted the music business. Again, yes, uh, artists still produce albums, 
but by far most music is obtained today uh, through one of a couple of means. One of those is actually buying or downloading the single or in turn subscribing to a service that would give you access to being able to call up and play uh, that particular song uh, without having to, to buy the album itself. So things like Spotify uh, being an example of that, music services. E even Apple, for example, has their subscription version of iTunes and Apple Music that allows you to pay a monthly fee in exchange for being able to access all of this music. I, I would argue that much of that came to be and would have come to be over time because of technology. The internet and Napster, uh, the rise of Napster and the rise of digital music was already morphing the music industry into that. But when you marry that with a format show like American Idol that allowed that to be promoted and to be accelerated, American Idol, I believe, becomes a catalyst for how that works on a weekly basis. Uh, and again, with not just with an established artist, which is where this digitalization was definitely going to go and has gone, but even with new artists as a way of launching them and launching them in a cost-effective way that's still profitable for everyone that's involved in the transaction, American Idol is an important catalyst for that. If you don't have an American Idol, you still have digital music, probably somewhat like what we do today, but I don't think you have it ha having grown as big or having grown as, as being the norm quite as much without the extra influence of American Idol. One of the other, I think, interesting things about that's a what-if about American Idol is how it brought, I think to some degree, country music more into the American music main mainstream. I happened to grow up in the American South slash West, uniquely positioned here in Houston, Texas, where we sort of sit on the, we're sort of a southern, southern city, but we're also a western city. And so I'm very familiar with uh, country music having grown up in an environment where that was popular, country and western music. Uh, but country music tended to be a little bit more of a regional phenomena up until when I was um, in my early teens as it grew because of movies like Urban Cowboy, <laughs> set in Houston, just to give you the, the concept of that, actually set just outside of Houston, the suburb called Pasadena. But um, the rise of country and western as a broader musical format really takes over to some degree because of that influence in pop culture in the late 70s and early 80s becoming more national versus more regional. But to me, one of the most interesting things about American Idol is it came over from Britain where it was called Pop Idol. And I think definitely it was the case and the thinking was in the early days of American Idol, and Kelly Clarkson represents this and some of the early winners, uh, Fantasia Barino, for example, in one of the early seasons, you know, very much in the, in the context of pop music, um, in, 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 the, in how we think of pop music. Uh, soul R&B can be played into that, but these are looking for pop stars. However, in season four, the winner of American Idol is Carrie Underwood, and she is decidedly a country music act. Now, you might argue about how much country and pop music have overlapped and interfaced in the last 20 to 30 years. That's a whole other discussion, even, I guess, in 30 or 40 years. That's a whole other discussion. But the fact that one of the winners of American Idol, which had been Pop Idol in Britain, in season four is a country artist, and that you've had a number of times since then, uh, Scott McCreary, the, the list goes on and on uh, about these uh, about the winners from American Idol that are definitely country artists. And even some of the, again, non-winners that came on to fame were also in the country genre. And so one of the, I think, other impacts that we need to recognize when it comes to American Idol and what if there had not been an American Idol is I think it was a major catalyst for certainly an industry that was already in good shape and had its following. Country music was certainly has existed and would exist without American Idol, but it brought country music into more of a mainstream format or enabled more of the crossover type of artist. Uh, Carrie Underwood gets play on quote-unquote pop radio. She definitely gets play on country radio. And even as those things, again, I've said this a couple of times, so I'll stop saying it, as they morph back and forth and they're sort of loosely defined and artists can sort of move between the various genres and the genres in some ways maybe closer to each other, there is no doubt that American Idol launched a number of country stars. Now, of course, there were other the reality shows like country music television had their own version of American Idol that was intentionally designed for, for country stars. Uh, it's true on The Voice. It's true on even uh, things like X Factor and other talent shows that aren't exclusively 
musically oriented but had musical acts that are part of them is that if there had been no American Idol, I don't think you would have had quite the explosive growth of country music and country music also sliding over into the digital age and the digital phase that I'm talking about if it hadn't been for American Idol and hadn't been in particular uh, for season number four winner Carrie Underwood, who at this point is now the most prolific ar artist that has ever come out of American Idol, eclipsing Kelly Clarkson. She's sold over you know, $100 million worth or $100 million versions uh, of, of her albums and of her songs. Uh, massive. Uh, the other thing, you know, also still cultural influence here, you have other artists like an Adam Lambert. So here's a very unique artist that comes along in a particular season and uh, ends up, uh, you know, sort of changing and, and being a uh, divisive personality in the sense that people loved him or hate him to some degree, uh, partly because of, of music, musical elements, but also because of cultural and social elements, but then actually goes on to become the new front man for one of the most iconic rock bands of all time, after Freddie Mercury is gone, he becomes the lead singer for Queen because he has the voice uh, to be able to uh, do that type of music, to, to do the type of presentation that Freddie Mercury did, some of the same personality uh, to a degree in ways. But actually you have, even because of American Idol, the ability for long-standing acts to find new blood and bring in new blood to what's there. That's the other thing I want to mention, sort of in, sort of in closing here about one of the other influences of American Idol is the ability to restore, rehabilitate, or rejuvenate careers. If you look at the list of those who have been judges on American Idol, again, probably a whole separate episode could be devoted to what if there had been no Simon Cowell and the impact of that. And that We may actually do that at some point uh, it, it, down the road because I think it would be an interesting thing to explore from the judge side. But most of the judges over time came to be there were still some other musical producer types, sort of the Randy Jackson-ish Jackson, Jackson -ish type of thing uh, that they did in the first couple of years. But for the most part, moving forward after that, it became artists that were looking sort of Paula Abdul-ish in the sense of revitalizing their careers, revitalizing their notice. One example that's there is Jennifer Lopez was a judge on the show for a couple of years. And what's interesting to know about J-Lo is that she had been dropped essentially by her record label less than two years before her appearance, or about the time of her appearance as a judge. Within two years of being a judge on the show, she had gone from being dropped by her record label and perhaps moving off of the, of the popular culture scene in terms of being an active element of what was there. Uh, because of that, two years later, she's on the Forbes list of the 100 most influential entertainers. Why is that? Because she's a judge on American Idol when the show is still popular enough that it gives her visibility, it gives her credibility, exposes her potentially to a whole new set of fans that didn't exist before because of the viewership of the show, and so the ability to relaunch or restart a career. And you see this a couple of different times. Steven Tyler from Aerosmith fame, who's a judge for a couple of years, uh, you know, Aerosmith had done its thing and had done its thing for a long time, but he sort of reinserts himself into popular culture as a result of, of what's there. And then, again, mentioning this country influence over time, eventually they do bring along um, artists that had been primarily known in the country genre, including today. The current version of the show as it exists on ABC has Luke Bryan as one of its judges. He is a country star, bona fide country star. It also has Lionel Richie, a bona fide going back in time pop star. Uh, the other one that's there is Katy Perry who definitely is a more modern pop star. Now, you might argue that in some ways it's, it's, it's just another avenue for Brian to continue his career. For Lionel Richie, it's a chance to rejuvenate his presence in the American movie, movie culture uh, and music culture. And in the case of Katy Perry, who's already a major star and significant, it's a chance for her to extend who she is even further. In fact, one of the things with ABC relaunching the show is they paid her a staggering amount of money to be a judge because they needed, in some ways, the credibility and the notice that would come with that, that to relaunch the show. And the show has gone back to a level not quite what Fox enjoyed, but substantial enough that the show is being renewed and is in a second life. And so, again, what if there had been no American Idol? There wouldn't have been this mechanism, as easy a mechanism, uh, for previous music stars, for other musical influences, to find a way back into being in front of the American public. In fact, one of the common things that happened on that show and continues to happen on that show 
is you have artists uh, that are affiliated with the record labels or they just basically work their way through for this reason to appear and do a guest appearance on the show either as a quote-unquote mentor, so they're seen throughout the entire course of that show interacting with the contestants, or to do a special performance. Why are they doing that special performance? You hear it at the end of every time the special performance happens because they're dropping their album or their single. It's a promotion. It's an advertisement for who they are inside of American Idol. And so that concept of, again, going back to what I talked about with Ford and with Coca-Cola and with AT&T and all of the other various companies uh, that utilize this format and utilize this show from an advertising standpoint, you see that going on with individual art artists who understand this is a place to get noticed and seen and have a better chance of success that's not dependent upon radio airplay for that single Radio still drives a lot of music, but because of streaming options now, I mentioned Spotify and the other streaming options that are out there and digital music, uh, it's much more difficult now to just rely upon hoping that your song gets played on the radio, hoping that it gets recognized, and hoping that that produces the types of sales that you need. Because remember now, the sales are primarily in the form of a digital single, uh, 99 cents to maybe a little bit more versus a digital album or certainly beyond the physical album as well. And so to have success in the music business today means you have to string together a number of large, highly successful singles uh, because you don't get the, the I heard one, I'm buying nine, even though I may not like them or want them aspect that went on way back in the day in terms of selling an album. So I'm sure that I've missed some things here going through the uh, what if there had been no American Idol, but hopefully I can, I've made enough of a point about why this is, yes, it's pop culture, and yes, it's television, and yes, it's music, but it's incredibly significant in terms of the impact that it had on, on that particular area of popular culture, and that popular culture, no doubt, influences uh, other areas of culture as well. So once again, we thank you for joining us today on A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Uh, we'll be back next week with talking about something I'm sure that is pure history and is serious, but occasionally we like to insert these types of shows as well. If you enjoy the show, we invite you uh, to visit our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. The A is important. The podcast is important to get there. That's where you can leave us feedback. That's where you can also make uh, topical suggestions. We have an entire menu of topical suggestions that we're working through on the production side that are not our thoughts, that are coming from our listeners. So keep us coming. You take us to places, you take us to time, and you take us to concepts that we might not normally think about. also invite you to check out our sister show, the, the second podcast that we launched, The Room Where It Happened. You can find information about The Room Where It Happened uh, there on the website as well, the shared website of aforkintidepodcast.com. And we invite you to, uh, to check us out. That's a slightly different format. You can find a little bit more about the show there as well. Most importantly, we thank you for giving us some of your time. Uh, that's the kindest thing that you can do for us. And so as I close out today, this is Don saying thanks for joining us here on A Fork in Time. And as always, we suggest that if you happen upon that fork in time, a good idea might be to take it. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash aforkintime or follow us on Twitter at A-F-I-T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash aforkintime. We hope you will join us next time.